My name is Michael Belcher. I am a cinematographer. And one thing that I love about cinema as a medium is the way in which with the elements of sound and image, we can get an almost infinite palette of possibilities to play with. We can keep things really simple and stripped down, you know, a locked off camera, black and white, just reducing the elements. Or we can add layer upon layer of technique and meaning and context with huge ensemble casts, enormous set pieces, pyrotechnics. And there are a few movies that maximize the possibilities of layering meaning and technique than this film, The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp, which was released in 1943 and was made by Powell and Pressburger. I'm discussing it here with cinematographer Adrian Peng Correa, who speaks about the film beautifully. Adrian is an award-winning cinematographer who has lensed projects all over the world. Over the last decade, he has shot dozens of feature films, commercials, documentaries, and TV shows, most recently including Flight Attendant and Love Life for HBO Max, Kevin Can F Himself for AMC Studios, Rami for Hulu, Glow for Netflix, and the upcoming Florida Man for Netflix. All right, here we go. Thank you. So the first thing I want to ask you about is... Um, before we get into why you chose this film, I'm just curious about when your relationship with Colonel Blimp began. When did you first see it? How did it strike you? Well, I had become uh, enamored with uh, Paul and Pressburger basically through the exposure with Martin Scorsese. He was such a huge Michael Powell fan and, uh, and uh, the Powell Pressburger connection known as the archers was was really important to him and scorsese was somebody who i looked up to not just for his own films but just for his like this kind of encyclopedic love of film you know and kind of such an eclectic taste and and when you have someone has such a specific perspective as he does you know like you kind of if it's important to you you kind of want to understand like maybe where uh, the foundations like where was he what what forge was he wrought from so to speak so you know, and like in that regard, you know, Powell and Pressburger came, came up and it wasn't something that, what I found interesting about Powell and Pressburger was not just the fact that they made movies, but just like the, the type of films they made. It wasn't something where they're, like, they're making something so artful, you know, they were making like things that were like, had this kind of specific artistry to the storytelling but they were also you know like populist in a way you know like so like they were making you know popular entertainment but they were doing it in such a way that had this really kind of like graceful and elegant kind of storytelling style and i was a big fan of jack cardiff's work and it just naturally led me back once i saw the red shoes and black narcissus and and uh and Peeping Tom to lead me back through the entire filmography of the, the, the Powell Pressburger connection. And um, I still love all the films I've seen of theirs, uh, but I don't know, for, for me with, with, with Colonel Blimp, it just ended up becoming, it's a film that's enriched itself to me the more I see it. Every time I see it, I see something new and. And in that regard, it's a, it's a really kind of, uh, it's been an enriching experience for me in that regard. I always remember when Roger Ebert talked about Ella Dolce Vita and how the movie changes for him over the course of, of his life. And, you know, it's different from when he was 20 versus when he was 30, when he was 40. And the way Vita was that for, for Ebert is kind of the way this film has been for me. Mm. So. Yeah. When when did you first see it, and how did you first come to it? It's not an obvious film to stumble upon. I mean, I'm guessing something through Scorsese, but was it something that you saw when you were already in the film business or before? In in the kind of in the infancy of my of career of film career, not necessarily even as a cinematographer, more as just as like a production assistant and whatnot. I was looking for. I was kind of looking for things that would kind of impact themselves to me in terms of the the creation of my own vision of what storytelling was. 
you know so in the beginning you, you watch it and it was just something where it's like it was it's kind of delightful in in the way that it kind of uses camera as an important storytelling element you know and just in the importance of blocking and structure of of a uh, staging scenes and 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 it was one of the first ones I ever noticed where like sound design played such an important storytelling role. It was the first one I ever noticed that in. And it's like, so in a way it's really important to me because it kind of taught me the importance of all these kind of different disciplines within filmmaking. And, and you know, just because there's such specific elements of cinematography that appeal to it, there are elements of editing that, that are really important to me that come from it sound design, like I've said. So it's, it's, it's kind of a touchstone for me. And then at the end of the day, I still get really wrapped up in the nature of the performances and the story. So those from a technical standpoint and also just from the purely emotional standpoint of the way that performances deliver for me. So I think that's a really interesting point to think about what inspires people and kind of taking the torch forward and pushing the medium forward. And, you know, so often we hear people talking about how young the medium still is and you know how much further it can go and i wonder for you if you think about think about it in those terms you know sort of this this kind of torch getting passed on and you know where is the next the next thing and you know a lot of times you think you know, one example that comes to mind is because it talks about the um the fencing scene and the way that it has this you know build up and then sort of you know kind of blows past the the main event, so to speak, without really showing the, the fight and how he did that in Raging Bull. And you sort of see the way, if you see them side by side, the Raging Bull buildup is this really long, dramatic, steady can shot, um, steady can shot that steps onto a crane and goes up and it's like really big, really grand. And you can sort of see that baton getting passed forward. And yeah, I wonder for you, you know, in, in the work that you do, when you look back to this, how does it how does it impact your work now? Or how do you think, are there any things in this film that you feel like you, like, oh, okay, I see a little piece there because I do this. I certainly have like, it, maybe a non-literal, but a, certainly a, a sort of subconscious Rolodex of things where it's like, oh, there's this little piece here that I, I see of inspiration from this little detail, this little scene that I want to remember that to maybe apply it in the future. Are there any little bits or bobs from Colonel Blimp that you feel like you just sort of hang on to is thinking, mm, maybe you haven't, you have already employed it or you sort of have it in the quiver for um, the right time? Well, I mean, uh, when you think of the, when you're like back, it's like, when you think, think about the point of storytelling, I mean, there's almost parts of this movie that are almost kind of quaint now. And there's, there's elements of like anachronisms that make it feel like it doesn't apply to to a modern audience. I mean, just in terms of the physical nature of some of the performance elements or just the style in which the, the camera kind of plays, it, it does feel kind of antiquated. But um, that's a kind of really interesting thing to me is, 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 is kind of like the way film reacts to subtext of time, you know? And that's why I kind of like the movie so much is the fact that like, there are things in the movie about people who are kind of like this specifically Colonel Blimp who are kind of like caught within the context of their own history and they can't kind of let go of things. And then they kind of live within the context of the past. They, and they let it influence their idea of what the future is. Uh, those themes become deeper and richer simply because of the nature of, of the way that the film is packaged. And when I shoot, I, I always think about the nature of the way the storytelling is going to be assessed. I, I think of it not just in the context of the moment that we shoot it. I try to boil it down to the simplest of essences, you know, because of the fact that it's like, what is the moment about? You know, in terms of like, I can move the camera as much as I want. I can create as much of a flourish within the context of color or contrast or framing or lens choice that uh, I want, but I always try to, whenever I try to think about the way I'm building something, I always think about the essence of the moment. And then I try to simplify as much as possible down to that, because I think because of the nature of the way that kind of storytelling is viewed over time, it's always something that could, if you engage in techniques and flourishes that end up becoming not necessarily 
classic or classicist in terms of the way that something is, is formulated. You know, I, I want it to be the camera to be a pure distillation of it, whether or not it's a dolly push or handheld or whatever. If it feels right to me in the moment through this kind of process of simplicity, then that's usually the way I try to implement it uh, with the use of camera or it just ends up feeling right to me. Um, now, when I was younger, uh, you know, I would gauge in this kind of like uh, stylistic flourishes that kind of uh, called attention to themselves from a cinematography standpoint, because I believe, and part of me still does, that like engaging in cinematography and camera work that is more participatory ends up allowing the camera to shine in a particular way that is appropriate to the medium. So sometimes I get caught within, between the idea of being understanding simplicity and then being able to kind of use all those quivers of what I believe participatory cinematography should be. And this movie has always been that kind of thing for me where it has this kind of surprising buildup of like how it treats, it almost builds suspense in a way that is really, it, it, it constantly builds and confounds the expectations of the audience. It's a really interesting uh, kind of directorial technique because there is a really particular element of story. And then there are times when like the, it races through elements, whether it means like the editing of a, the hunting uh, montage or that kind of stuff. But then there's like a two minute scene when they're talking about what is the nature of the duel, you know? And it's like, that would never survive in a modern film, you know, because it's kind of, it's kind of pointless. But there is this kind of, the funny thing is like, I remember when I was first watching the movie, I'm like, what the, what the heck is this scene about? Like, why is this here? And then like, it was only later after watching it several more times that I kind of understand the fact that like, it's, it, it kind of coax you, coaxes you into this idea of propriety and like what the idea of these, the system that Colonel Blimp has been, uh, that Gwen Candy has been brought up in. There's like, the, there's this, kind of like pomp and circumstance that doesn't play in the world anymore. And, and, and it kind of within one scene kind of ends up crystallizing this world that at one moment feels very, very important and very, very proper. And like, you need to consider all the rules and ideas of what this duel is. And then the very next moment when Candy walks in after you know reading the book and he's like, yeah, this it's kind of a joke. And there's so many times when kind of like Powell like sets up this world and then immediately subverts it, builds up all these things and kind of tears them down for literally, it feels like half an hour, the whole idea of this duel is gonna happen and it's going to be like, you know, like the, even the setting up of the duel, the way they're like testing their feet in the sandbox and all the, you know, and like, and stretching and playing with the sabers, there's all this pomp and circumstance and then the camera leaves, you know, and it's, it's a really, ballsy kind of movie in that way to me that like has the confidence of confidence of its own storytelling to kind of like build up the world and simultaneously tear it apart and I think it's a really kind of to me it's always been incredible in terms of the the, the confidence of the storytelling and just want and just the way they use camera like there'll be certain times where it's like set up from a set shot for two minutes and you think that's where the camera is going to be. And then suddenly the camera takes off traveling with people down hallways. And I, I, I remember specifically using that in, in the movie I shot Night Owls, where we would set up two shots and let the audience think that like, it was just gonna be a two shot and someone would move and then it would race into a new master at the same time. So there was this balance between allowing the actors to act within the frame and have complete control and, and, and concentration of the audience and then the camera kind of whips and moves and kind of forces the audience to re-engage after they've kind of settled in and thinking they're going to be in one thing in a moment. And there's this really kind of playing with the audience in a way from a timing and a movement and a storytelling perspective within the frame that I always found really fascinating. And I always try to employ that. I work mostly in TV now, so the a lot of that stuff doesn't necessarily apply or it won't survive the edit, so to speak, even if you try to implement it in. And, but my process is still the same. 
it may not always play within the context of the television of television work that I'm doing, but the process, that process of trying to understand where the audience will be in a moment and how do I play with that. I, I like that that nature, that kind of conducting within the frame with camera and blocking and actors. And I really think that's kind of the heart of storytelling. And that's why the movie, as much as I love it dramatically and comedically, I love it not only for that, I love it for the way that it, it teaches me something all the time that I watch it. And I love that about it. I love the fact that it is almost like a masterclass in storytelling from a director directorial standpoint and a cinematography standpoint, sound design standpoint, it's that, yes. But then I also just really like the story. It's this wonderful combination also of epic and intimate. And I love that idea of creating these massive worlds and putting these people in it when it's basically a really personal, psychological, individual story. And then it's wrapped in this idea of history and society and class and propriety and I don't know. It's um, I find it a really incredibly epic movie, and in, in in the best way, not in the Lawrence of Arabia scale kind of way, but in terms of the ideas and the psychology of it. It's, I I, I love it in 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 every regard. Yeah, yeah, it's all really well said. The the layers to this film, I mean, it just makes you wonder how you could keep track of it all. You know, there's so much consciousness in it you know consciousness about the medium consciousness about the culture consciousness about the the nature of telling the story with the medium but also just with the writing you know some of these some of these through lines are just even now feel like really innovative it still feels to me really innovative <laughs> to have a story be so focused on friendship non-romantic friendship you know um and to have the romantic bits be really relevant, but never dwelled on, right? Like all those, all the really like emotional beats. I mean, it's like, it's stark. Like the, all the emotional beats are between friends. You know, it's like when you, like, I'm thinking about the scene, um, you know, after Teo has gotten out of the prison camp and is at that, in that room with all the kind of British military kind of brass at this dinner table with candy and they're just so kind to him and he's just like he's there he's just like fawning over him he's just taking such good care of him as if he was his lover i mean it's like the most intimate loving heartful generous thing and i'm just like wow we don't see enough films about friendship you know like i'm watching this i'm like wow this is really like the main arc of this story in terms of character relationships is totally this this through line of this friendship and that still feels totally fresh totally like exhilarating to me as an audience member be like wow like friendship what a mystery how do we become friends yeah you know it's, it's just just as interesting to me as falling in love um and yet it doesn't there's just not not a lot not a strong history not that many films really come to mind scarecrow comes to mind that uh, jerry schatzberg film but um there aren't that many and um I, I feel like it's it's doing that in a number of different ways. That's just one way, you know. The other way is our, um, yeah. The other ways are there too. Um, one thing I want you said earlier, I wanted to get back to. Um, this made me think about your work and how I was reminded of your work looking at this film. Um, early on, there's a scene where, um, well, first of all, the opening of the film is super exciting. It, it it for such a long film, it really is so conscious of like pacing and. And the quickness of the beginning, right? We kind of start in this typewriter and then we're off, off with these motorcycle riders as they're, they're doing their training thing. And then we end up in this, um, this sort of like hay barn in this hay mow, looking down at one of the sort of leading military younger generation guys. And we spend like half the scene up in the hay mow looking down and just drinking in the full, um, the full set. It made me think of just, you know, watching you work and the little bit that I've worked actually with you on set. I remember there's one scene when I was operating for you on, on Love Life where there's kind of a wide shot at, at night, you know, characters in bed 
And he said, oh, you know, you know, show me something and then we'll, we'll, we'll start there. And I set up a frame that kind of caught her face and, you know, some of the, 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 the bed and a little bit down the hallway. And you kind of walked in the room like, mm, why don't we see how high and how far we can get back up in here? And I went back up in there and I just realized how much more story was being told by getting further away, drinking in the whole scene, you know, and, you, and what you start to realize is that when you get a little bit further back, like the shot I'm thinking of that they hung on for like half the scene, a bunch of dialogue sort of like, you know, a layer or two down into the set, you get to drink in, once you create a wider angle that can allow the mise-en-scene to, to live in the frame, you have all these opportunities to do more storytelling with the sound design, with the lighting, with, you know, peripheral things, you know, a little flicker of something happening over there, a character walks through, this character's on top of the hay mail looking down, you, you get so much more a sense of the world and the vibe. And I just thought, wow, it really reminds me of just that moment being on set with you of me sort of presenting an idea and you having a better one. And me just sort of seeing like, wow, there's so much more story to be told in that other composition. I could see in that moment the, the influence it may have had on you um, to tell a story with a little bit more depth and complexity, you know, such that we find in real life. Well, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing with the nature of wides or, you know, it's like, I mean, the funny thing about wides is like everyone loves like these kind of wides. I, mean, I always have directors telling me like how I love wides. I love cinematic wides. I know like with cinematic, something becomes cinematic, not just because of the size of it. it you know, it's, it's cinematic because of the scale of what character means within the context of that wide. You know, like if you have an actor who uses space and their body, uses their body and then uses space in a really particular way, you can tell a lot more story depending on how much more you see of an actor, how much more space you allow the actor to inhabit in the context of your framing. Um, I always end up, I usually try to watch rehearsal from where camera, where I see the camera being. You know, like I never just arbitrarily pick a place to watch rehearsal from. I always think about where I want to put the camera, where I think I'm going to put the camera. And then I'll watch it from there. And then if they, and then when they go and they run it for marking rehearsal to show the crew, I'll then move somewhere else, you know, and I can, and I kind of end up watching the performance and the actor in the context of their body in the space, I can get another perspective that ends up, could end up opening up something to me really interestingly. And even in television where so much of your stuff is going to play in coverage, especially in comedy, you know, where, where the joke and the timing of said jokes are going to be given precedence. Always. It doesn't mean you shirk your duties as a cinematographer in terms of the way you use camera. I still, I don't care that they're going to play the stuff in close up. They very well may, but I need to give and shoot the scenes in a way that I feel maximize all of it. And usually what that means, especially for comedians, for me, any actors really, is just the way they use their bodies. Body language is so critical. I mean, I, I remember in the beginning when I, when I was shooting, I would always shoot close-ups too tight. Always. And the way that's evolved over the years is I keep moving farther and farther back and not shoot. And if I go in for a tight, it's for a reason. You know, if I'm going in for really tight framing, like there better be a really good reason for it. If, if I can't see like the middle of someone's chest and feel their shoulders and see the way they're holding some of the contours of their musculature, those things are critical parts of performance for me now. And it's funny how I want my cameras to see detail, but I want my cameras to be wide enough for the audience to feel context with the performer and for me to be able to see the nature of the way they're using their body language. That's definitely shifted. And then one of the reasons why is classical filming and the way the, the especially, specifically the Academy ratio frames actors and their bodies. I mean, it's, it's a really, it's only, it is portraiture in the old Academy gate. And it really does favor shooting actors in a particular way that, that really showcases their bodies. I mean, there's some really great wide angle close-ups, even in the bathhouse scene when they go in and they were after the first scene, which you're right, has incredible pacing and energy with the camera work 
you know, the, that's the, the driving camera work and the, the, the motorcycle camera work has this really great energy to it. And then you get into the bathhouse where when Candy is going to be basically uh, unfairly uh, taken by these young officers who don't want to play by the rules of war starting at midnight, there are some really great wide angle close ups, just cutaways of like random soldiers who are using their bodies in very specific ways and they're wide angle filmed, filmed mediums with little pushes, even just like little things that like took a good deal of time to set up and light, but like communicate like youth and verb and energy and this kind of, you can feel the kind of preposterous confidence of youth and some of the, these framing shots of these young soldiers. And then you kind of go back to Candy and Candy has this kind of really classical, dignified, handsome medium close-ups that are a little bit longer and treat him with a certain reverence. And it's just funny how that's those specifics of framing of these, these people and these surrounding soldiers and the way they carry themselves in the frame physically against these kind of like not bloated walruses, so to speak, but these people who are like, have, have, have not grown accustomed to finery and, 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 and in their old age because they're still soldiers, but there's a certain, different idea of what it means to be like youthful and for someone to have experience. And that's another thing that kind of ties into the whole idea of the picture, you know, like people who live like in the past and people who kind of like dwell within their experience in terms of the way that they deal with their lives in the future. I, and there's so many di interpersonal dynamics with, with, the, with the way those relationships are built throughout the film that I just find fascinating, so. Yeah, totally. I, I love the way you're pointing out the this, you know, um, this difference between the young and the old and the, you know, this major theme of evolution, evolution, and um, yeah, just um, progress and adaptation, and the the generation gap. And, you know, as a cinematographer, I'm, I'm quite torn, I go back and forth. A lot of times I'm thinking about a certain project in a, an extremely classical sense where I'm thinking, um, you know, really in the language of movies that have come before. And then a project will come up where I'm thinking, how can I make every single image in this something I've never seen before? Um, and just totally push myself and push the medium to be something new. And, you know, you can see cinematographers who have careers I mean, you know, broadly speaking, off the top of my head, you know, someone like Roger Deakins seems to be um, very consistent and fairly classical. Um, he does new things and innovates without a doubt, but he has a little bit more of a consistency to his work. Whereas someone like, I don't know, I like Lubeski is always kind of doing something more radically different, maybe in technique or in form. And I wonder how you think about that or, you know, for your work, are you thinking about yourself as being a really classical, just technical, emotional use of the, of the tools? Or are you feeling like you are pushing yourself with that more kind of youthful vigor that, like you say, like that sort of preposterous confidence in a way to, to go on, on the, the razor's edge? I think it's an interesting thing because TV specifically kind of shaves down that part of yourself. As cinematic as TV work is nowadays, and it certainly is, as a cinematographer, depending on who you're working with, you can have a tremendous amount of control and you can have very little control over the way things are finally done. You know, there's a certain authorship that comes with cinematography, period. But, I mean, let's be fair. I mean, like, your authorship can be completely changed within the context of post now. So, I mean, for me, I always try to end up, once I start to formulate what the idea of a show or a film should be, and having the direction and kind of like sharpening the blade of it, along the minds of the people who are closest to the, to the uh, project, whether it's the showrunner or the creator, the writers per episode, who's number one on the call sheet and how they see their character. 
you kind of take all those things into consideration. And then you basically try to, I try to give myself a real idea of what is the emotional, the best emotional representation of the show and the characters. And that influence, and then basically that as the divining rod gives me a guidance in terms of like what kind of lenses I want to use, what kind of LUTs do I want to use, how do I want to build the photography over a scene. And then like, I'll give a ex perfect example, you know, like I'm doing this show right now called Kevin Can F Himself. I don't know if we could swear on your podcast, um, but you know what the F is for. Um, and, you know, like Annie Murphy is the number one, you know, and uh, she is a really... I mean, incredibly photogenic woman, All right? She's incredibly beautiful. And that doesn't necessarily work for Allison's character in this show. Now, I mean, part of the Kevin Kenneth himself is that we're subverting the idea of the sitcom wife, you know? And the idea of like these preposterously attractive women who are married to these kind of People who you're like, why is this person married to this idiot? And um, and the funny thing is, is that in the multicam sitcom world of Kevin, we photograph Allison, Annie, as as prettily as you would any traditional sitcom wife in TV. You know, she has to look that way. You know, she has to have these ideas, not just of... Uh, the idea of, of, of what you beautifully photograph an actress as, but also the audience expectations of what these women are supposed to look like, like in a sitcom, which is almost always like really attractive, you know? And it's like, and then the funny thing is then we go into the single cam world and then I made a, a conscious and active decision to not shoot Annie as beautifully as I could because she has so many things about her face that are classically perfectly beautiful. And I would kind of do things that I would never do to, I mean, like you, like the things you would think of getting fired for, frankly, mm. you know, it's like there's things you always think about like classic Hollywood cinematographers photographing their number ones is like, I remember like, there's that great line from, I think Harry Stradling says it in, um, the uh, visions of light where like he's talking about filming older classic actresses like Jean Arthur and Jean Harlow and all the rest of these people. And, uh, and he's like, they don't care where the shadows are. They don't put them on their faces. They've got to look beautiful. They've got to look like everything. And part of the show is to kind of like, my show is to kind of like knock some of those expectations of the audience down, you know, with angles that aren't necessarily as flattering. Um, you know, like maybe not giving her the, the fill light that she would normally have or like losing an eye in terms of like photographing the face, you know, um, kind of reveling in the fact that Annie can be really beautiful in almost every other way. And then she can, be, depending on what you can do, make someone look a little bit ridiculous and awkward. And, and that is something we've been kind of road mapping in terms of like how to frame a character in a way that doesn't necessarily make them always look in the best light. And then in certain, and then like the way you strategically, excuse me, the way you strategically use close-ups as a cinematographer in this show, we've strategically used lighting to beautify her and make her look the most beautiful in a couple of moments that are very specific story points. And then we allow that beauty to either be fulfilled within the context of the believability of the drama in terms of like, she should look the most beautiful at this moment because she feels the most beautiful or she looks the most beautiful at this, at this moment because she thinks this is when she's the happiest. And then we can either reinforce or deconst further deconstruct and take that away from her. So it's kind of, uh, it's a little bit unfair and it's a little bit abusive to Annie's character, but part of that is this delusion, this self-delusion about who she is and what status she holds in her own life, what power she holds for the determination of her own life and self. 
So in, in, a, in a certain way, the cinematography of the show becomes not just a commentary about how the way she sees herself, but the way the audience sees her or the way the audience feels like they're supposed to be seeing her. And there's a lot of that kind of subtextual cinematographic storytelling that takes place over the course of the way we shoot her and frame her and light her just in from a from a close up to, to close up basis from a scene to scene basis and it's a it's an interesting it's an interesting roadmap to follow as a storyteller because we're just shooting coverage that is supposed to communicate drama or comedy or whatever but we're using lighting and framing and lens choices lens height a camera height uh, all these little things to kind of pepper and season our, our cinematographic storytelling. And that's what I feel like Colonel Blunt does a lot of to me is using camera in unexpected ways to tell a story and in ways that are participatory. And that's what I try to employ when it comes to the way I frame and the way I shoot everything, whether it means not letting Anna Kendrick look her best in a scene in an episode where she's just had her appendix taken out. And if you're putting an edge light on her that highlights maybe a hair or two on her cheek or face that maybe you wouldn't normally see, it's okay to see her because she's recuperating and she shouldn't look like a trillion dollars. Like she's one of the most beautiful women in Hollywood. I don't, women have an incredibly unfair burden uh, because they have a very specific way they're supposed to be lit and shown over the course of their careers and for a very fucking short time. I mean, like, I remember I was reading an article a while ago about like Anne Hathaway and how like she was starting to not get these kind of young ingenue parts anymore. And she's an incredibly beautiful woman who looks like a trillion freaking dollars. And you just kind of wonder like where, how, what is this shelf life? What is this idea of what someone being beautiful and I, I, it baffles my mind. So I try to, when I now, when I work with actors and actresses, like I try to allow them to look the way their part is supposed to give. I, I try to give them the freedom to be able to look that way. If, it, if the moment calls for it, as opposed to just being fucking a-list number one beautiful on the call sheet all the time i find like the the tyranny of that need for it to be beauty from a beautiful from a cinematographic standpoint uh, i'm 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 constantly trying to push us past the idea of women having to look beautiful every single moment they're on screen i i find that unfair and i find it very limiting just from an acting standpoint and from a performance standpoint i think women are have a certain women have all the confidence and, and power and tools in the world in terms of being able to use their beauty as a supportive and enforcing or subversive uh, choice. You know, it's, yeah. No, sorry, that kind of went off into a weird tangent. No, it's beautiful, man. Um, I so appreciate you saying all that. It makes me um, excited about your show. I think that, um, yeah, what you're speaking to it feels like it, it really doesn't serve anyone doesn't serve the story most of the time when we're sort of you know overemphasizing or trying to maximize someone's beauty all the time it doesn't serve of course the performance um and i don't think it it, it serves the audience either i think it's really placating to some kind of weird part of our animal brain that um yeah i think society culture ready to go to the next the next step of of being more interested in, in meaning than we are in um like arousal or like some kind of like titillation you know it's, it's very cheap very shallow and um, what you're speaking to is is beautiful and it's funny you know thinking about all the ways in which colonel blimp doesn't it, the ways in which it does have a huge amount of commentary for you know british culture and the generation gaps and friendship and military um one thing it does do is it does it does sort of push along it does sort of fall in, in step with the tradition of the sort of diffusion filter on the lady which i noticed you know it's, it sticks out you know this day and age you can sort of see that filter um on the love interest 
And um, it surprises me looking, you know, hearing you talk about this, I'm like, right, that's this, the piece, you know, the conventions of that time, that's the piece that wasn't quite ready to be broken off. You know, that's a piece where they still stayed in line with the tradition. But it's funny because it actually works in a really interesting way from a story standpoint, mm. because Deborah Carr is incredibly, I mean, she's, look at her, she looks, she looks incredible in the movie. I mean, she is immaculately photographed but there but the whole point of the idea of edith to johnny and the middle woman's name which i can't remember i apologize but like she's almost frozen in time she looks exactly as beautiful in every stage of blimp's life and that is not just a commentary about like oh like we're supposed to film this person beautifully she's not just about being beautiful she's a memory and she's in i mean it's almost at the point where like blimp doesn't even view these particular they're they're viewed as kind of like an ideal mind of uh, ideal uh, an ideal idea of love in 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 blimp's mind and it's something really interesting to me how she's kind of like she has decided that Edith is a very proper, educated woman. She has this kind of high society thing. And then by the end, Johnny is this kind of like, kind of brassy fucking World War II, uh, like a soldier. But she looks almost exactly the same in each one of these iterations that she is in the movie. And there's something about that that commentates, not just about her being beautiful, but it speaks about memory. It speaks about the nature of loss. It speaks about the nature of remembrance. So is it a shallow representation photographically in terms of like always making her look beautiful? Yes, but it's also a really important story point. And that's where the value and subtext comes, to, comes into. Does she really have a ton of scenes where she gets to like develop as a character? Clearly not. It's definitely not a woke movie in that regard, but at least the photographic representation of her over time in the movie is integral to the theme of the movie to me which is about this powerful meditation on the nature of loss and the nature of memory and the value and the idea of how we shift over time the things we hold on to the things we have to let go and how that affects us i mean i mean blimp himself even says when he's talking to uh teo like that he loved his teo's wife and like, just like, just, just that commentary about like this kind of, also another thing about the stiff upper lip of, of Brits suffering silently. There's something really kind of like wistful and kind of like uh, this this unrequited nature of, of love. And there's something unrequited about the way that, that Blimp lives his very life, you know? Whereas somebody like, I mean, my, my favorite scene in the movie doesn't involve Colonel Blimp, which is funny, which is when Teo comes back and tries to re-enter England after his wife, Deborah Carr, has passed away and he's lost his sons to the Nazi party. I mean, th that scene where he basically tries to get recharacterized not as an enemy alien, but as a expert chemist and to be admitted to the country and work. I mean, it's one of my favorite scenes I've ever seen in the movie. Not just because of the way that the camera work and Anton Wolverock, who's one of my favorite actors, incredible performance the great singular camera move that tracks into a close-up and then pulls back out and then the way powell removes sound there's all these street sounds and cars passing and then as soon as teo starts to get into the story all that stuff gets bled away from the from the from the soundtrack and the sound design goes almost completely just about teo's story and then like i was i it's it's a master class in direction and it's just so great. I just, I don't know. And, and it distills down into this three minute story, basically everything about the movie. If you really want to say this movie is too freaking long, you could just watch that scene. You basically get an encapsulation of everything about what the movie's kind of about in this one scene. I just, I don't know. I, I, I adore it. I think, I think that kind of, this kind of movie does yeah, and it's about filmmaking to me. Everything about this movie is about the power of filmmaking, and it's like a, it's like a tool chest, really. If you just keep watching this movie, it's kind of like a mini film school in terms of all the things you can kind of use. And I don't know, I, I 
I dig it. I, I'm, I'm a really big fan. Of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks for reframing that viewpoint um, or perspective on the, the female close up. I hadn't quite um, gotten to the layer of uh, interpretation to see the meaning that that provides to the film, but it's such a good point. They use that convention in a way that is meaningful to the story and to the characters. And I appreciate you highlighting that and uh, reframing it for me. Oh, believe me, you still get, I still get nervous. <laughs> I mean, Annie, Annie Murphy gave an interview in Vanity Fair where she talked about like the fact that she gets to do ugly things in the show and how the, and when they saw her and Mary Hollis who are, plays our number two, Patty in the show, like saw dailies and they were like, oh my God. Like, we're, like they were like nervous about how they looked and it's like, we're not trying to make something safe, but it's, but it, yeah, it gave me pause, <laughs> you know, but it's like, you never <laughs> like to hear that, but it's like, we have to, we're making a very particular kind of show. And then like, we're heading towards a particular kind of idea. And then like, we just filmed the scene two days ago where the idea of what it means to be, who this person is, is kind of revealed in a way in, in a scene with the, between Patty and her and, all these things that we've been building in terms of like framing and shooting her in a way that isn't traditionally beautiful, kind of in one close up, she, Annie, and with her performance, turned this kind of nebulous idea of photography into concrete storytelling that delivered on the promise of what we've been working on all season. And as soon as I saw that close up, I remember I went to my my a camera operator and I, I was and uh, Shannon and I was talking about the fact that like the with this is kind of the the, I, the 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 moment when photographic idea becomes crystallized through performance. Yeah, they see actually see a dialogue almost between the two where the you're really supporting a move you know chess move that happens you know multiple episodes away. I'm trying to tell this story. I'm trying to change the idea and the perception of this character. And then at some point, the character's actor's execution takes that idea and then it morphs it into something else. And then that becomes part of the firmament within the show. And when that happened, I was like, I, I didn't need to do anything else for the scene. Then there was no more need for camera theatrics or no more need for camera pushes or movement. I knew when we saw, I saw that close up while I was watching it performed, I was like, we have the scene and we have the turn for the last uh, quarter of the season. Yeah. And I was like, and it was something we'd been trying to build over the course of five episodes. Nice. It was, it was great. It was, I felt like not vindication, but I felt like the excitement of what the possibility of something. So, yeah, that's awesome, man. Happy to see that kind of payoff. Um, I want to ask you about the critique. You know, is there anything in this, in, in Colonel Blimp that you would change if you could, you know, is it flawless in your mind or is there something, some little moment or scene or something that, that nags at you? Well, I mean, it's impossible not to free frame any classic movie through the lens of, of modernity, not just in the way that you would view women or you would how you would rewrite those parts, but even something as simple as like the first time it transitions from when Blimp is beating up the young man and in, in the he shoves him into the 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 bath and he's like these wild flailing missing punches that don't connect obviously even though he's supposed to be beating the shit out of him. And then they go down into the water, like they're wrestling in the water and they stop and the camera doesn't leave them fast enough. So it's just like, oh, this is a little bit of a weird transition. And then it's a little bit bumpy because of the nature of the camera is not stabilized in a real way. And you know, it's like, a, there's all those little technical things that you're kind of like, mm, right. Uh, but it's like, I don't know. The, part of that is the charm of, of what actual filmmaking is. You know, like that's why it's a mistake to like remove, in my opinion, to remove the reflection on the piece of glass in Raiders of the Lost Ark so that you kind of see the fact that the Cobra isn't, never really could strike Harrison Ford because there's a piece of glass and you can see the reflection of the Cobra in it. And you're like, 
I love that shit. Like, that's the kind of stuff I want. I love those seams. I love that when the filmmaking center doesn't hold and those stitches start to pull a little bit and you see those kind of imperfections. I don't know. That's what filmmaking... I love that stuff. I just... I, that, that's why I always like, like, older E.T. without, you know, visual effects, you know, increasing the, the betterment of performance. I, I kind of... But that's also, again, this is ties back into Blimp. That's my memory of what filmmaking is. And then if anybody sees, you know, E.T. now, they're like, oh, that's a much better performance when you can mm. digitally manipulate it. And and there are so many things like that in Blimp. There's, there's you can see the lines in some of the mad paintings. You can see the fact that like the, some of the, the uh, photographic effects aren't perfect anymore. Uh, you could... I mean, there's always question. There's always questionable racial shit, and just the in, in in any of these older movies, especially when you're talking about British Empire films and the way it's. There's always questionable things, but I mean, I was a history major, and it's always the benefit for me of being able to look at something and let it live within the context of the time, and then still appreciate appreciate it for what it is. And that's part of what is difficult for me to criticize or think about changing because then it's not the thing that I love anymore. So it's, especially with this film, it's really difficult for me to look at something and be like, this needs to change. I mean, there are just certain things about editing that I would just tighten up an extra moment or two. Yeah. But, you know, like, I, 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 that's, that's my version of Colonel Blimp. I'm always re reminded of the time, like how Gene Siskel hated or didn't like Taxi Driver. And he said, oh, well, like, you know, like the, uh, and the ending is so abhorrently violent. And, uh, and then like, you know, criticized, like, why did the ending have to be this way? And then Ebert is like, yeah, but then if it doesn't have this ending, then it's not the movie. And I kind of feel a lot of that with older films is like, I could change those things, but then it's not the movie. Mm. And, and I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not the best at being able to find the holes in that kind of thing. Whereas, you know, like, I, you know what I really don't like, and this is from personal experience that kind of extends now into watching something. I don't like it when I watch a movie and I can tell that scenes have been cut out and they've had to stitch together pieces of it, you know? Um, where it feels like, oh, obviously there are two scenes that were missing here that would explain these kind of things. And, and part of the, the joy of, of, of Blimp is that it has this kind of pastiche style to it because it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a historical epic, but it's also like this kind of like storybook. It starts with the, 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 soldiers saying the hell with it we're not starting war at midnight and it ends with the same story again you know so there's something really kind of like that those bookends do create this kind of storybook feel to it mm. and but then there's thing uh, i don't know i i can't criticize this I, I can't i'm biased i can't criticize this movie i love it it's one of my favorite movies it's like top three for me frankly well it's fascinating what you're saying about seeing the scenes right or seeing that the, or feeling the tension at least of the illusion fading i think there's something really exciting about that when we become when we become it to, it's got to be it's like the right percentage of awareness of the illusion right it's like yes. you don't want to see too much because then you're really pulled out but there's a way in which when we we sort of are aware that we're seeing magic or aware that there's an illusion happening that's why i love magic like magicians to no end because i know there's a thing happening and I, and I just i love the tension that it holds right but if i was totally immersed in in something completely i might i might not it might not be as exhilarating so it's interesting i never quite thought of it this way but yeah i like what you're pointing to the way this um that, that having a little bit of tension in the illusion um yeah adds adds a sort of magic to it it makes it feel more like magic than like reality right it's like oh i'm watching a movie it's totally perfect and paced out and everything just feels so natural i'm just watching reality there's a certain kind of filmmaking that feels important in that way but mm -hmm. another kind of filmmaking that especially something that's you know technicolor and like 
you know, low ISO and like hard light, that there is something that is a little bit theatrical or at least elevated about it or just presentational, like stagey, um, that having sure. a little bit of that tension um, feels appropriate in a way. And it just has its own, its own flavor. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely that to this movie. There's definitely a theatricality to it, you know, and then there's, and, and that definitely does affect your ability to judge things from a reality standpoint, but it's also a memory, you know, it's like a, it's like a living memory. So like the structure of the movie is kind of built in this kind of not infallibility, but like you, it, it, it's just really smartly constructed. And then there are moments when the, the like the, the Teo scene, which is basically just him reveling through the idea of his memory of why he wanted to come back to England. And then at the end, when, when Colonel Blimp is standing after he's been, uh, after he's been kind of relieved of duty and he's like staring out of the water. And then there's like this, this autumn leaf is floating in the water for like, it seems like a sec seven second insert. And then he talks about the idea of like, when the floods come, then I'll change and look at me now. And I still have the flood is coming. I'm still not changed. Like there's so much poetry in the movie. It, there's so much, it's kind of funny because it's a story about military men and, and this idea of, of, of honor. And, but like, there's so much emotional poetry to the movie. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of beautiful in the way that it kind of, shirks the emotion of the moment and then kind of like revels in it and again that's about a person uh, a directorship of kind of this authorship of understanding the emotional expectations of the audience and like subverting it at some points and delivering upon it in others i just i think if you want to understand how to play an audience in a way that's really a high wire kind of act in terms of like teetering on the edge of failure just really easy for a two hour and 42 minute movie. I think it's an incredibly fascinating watch and then rewatch, not just because the movie is great in my estimation, but just, just the ability of being able to rewatch it and then try and reverse engineer how it's put together in this way. It's an incredibly confident piece of filmmaking. And part of it is this joy of watching him of Powell and Pressburger on the high wire of, of, of knowing when and how to manipulate the audience. And they do it again and again all over their fucking filmography from, from uh, Matter of Life and Death, Stairway to Heaven, uh, f f um, to, to this, to Black Narcissus, to Red Shoes. Um, even the, uh, some of the Wendy Hiller films, like I Know Where I'm Going, I just, I, Thief of Baghdad, Peeping Tom, there are so many examples in the filmography of this real high wire act where it's not just about storytelling, but it's a, but the, the nature and the power and the use of directorial authorship and in, in, in really taking big chances. I, I think it's inspiring movie in that regard too. I, I don't know, it, it blows my mind. Yeah, mine too, mine too, frankly. And you speak about it so beautifully. I, I totally appreciate your insights. Um, uh, I think a good question to end on is a question about a question. Um, if you could ask one question to Pal and Pressburger, um, what might you ask them about this film or filmmaking in general? You know, anything. I mean, for me, I would if I was talking to Pal and Pressburger about their movies, I would ask them how what is the critical point that you're more moving towards at the end. Like, where, what is that horizon point? What is that destination? Is it an emotional through point? Is it some type of, like, or is it an emotional theme? Is it a psychological one? Is it built within the character? Or is it outside the character? And is it represented in, as the, in the film as a whole? And then is your authorship heading directly towards that moment always? And I guess what I'm asking is like, how do they blueprint their storytelling? Because that's the thing that always gets me about their movies. And no matter what genre they're doing, whether it's something that's more comedic or it's something dramatic, they always end up being able to kind of, kind of their compass never really wavers to me. 
And that's what I'm most interested in <clears throat> is their navigation of it, their navigation of their storytelling. Mm. That's a beautiful question. And then maybe that's more of a methodology in terms of their directorship. And that's about directing as opposed to cinematography. But I just find their idea of what that is. That's the thing that's most compelling to me. Their compass in terms of the way they handle their storytelling to me always plays well. And it's, it's incredible to me because directors are wildly inconsistent with it. Some, I mean, even really successful, incredible directors like always end up having something where I'm like that left turn at Albuquerque type shit where I'm like, Ooh, that, no, this doesn't work at all. And I feel like even with their most challenging films, and I think structurally blimp is right up there. Like it never falters to me. Mm. There are so many ways this movie could fail, frankly. Um, and, and to me, it doesn't fail. And it's, that stuff blows my mind. Great, that kind of great directorship. Well, that's a really, um, this is a really mature question to ask. And it really shows me that you as a cinematographer inherently must approach your work. Certainly in my experience, but I think this question points to it as well. Um, they're coming at your job from a real global filmmaker perspective. And um, that's awesome, really inspiring and the kind of thing we we hope to see from every department, right? Not people just sort of navel gazing and trying to do the best work that they can do for themselves, but to to really contribute to, um, to a film as a collaborator. And um, that's the vibe you've always put out. And I, I love that you chose this film. I love that you chose that question. Um, this has been great, man. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Michael. It was a pleasure.